Mm -hmm. Hi, everybody. My name is Rose Casanova, and this is Ali Zek. And today we're going to talk about um, we're gonna we we both of us had a response to the Jordan Peterson benzodiazepine uh, news that was released, and both Ali and I have gone through benzodiazepine withdrawal, and currently both of us coach people going through benzodiazepine withdrawal. So uh, I myself have been uh, off of benzodiazepines for about five years, and since a few year, uh, two years ago, I guess I started supporting people going through the tapering process. And Allie does the same thing. Um, do you want to tell them a little bit? Yeah, I have, have my benzo withdrawal was done um, inadvertently, not knowing how dangerous they were to come off of suddenly uh, in August of 2015. And uh, when I went to the emergency room, I was um, told it wasn't benzo withdrawal, that it was actually um, bipolar disorder. So I was diagnosed with that. Um, and I've been off of all of my psychiatric medications since around May of uh, 2016, so almost four years. And also you coach people. I do. Yes. Along so with the first thing I'm going to just go over is what is a benzodiazepine? Probably, um, I, I know sometimes I coach people and they don't even know that they're on a benzodiazepine, which is kind of interesting to me. Um, benzodiazepines are first used for, they're mostly used for muscle relaxers and uh, anticonvulsants, and, but they are mainly sub, uh, prescribed for anxiety, insomnia, and panic disorder. So those, those I think that's the main like um, reason why doctors would prescribe them. Um, benzodiazepines are common, like they've been called benzos. That's a, that's a name that, you know, uh, that they're commonly called. They go under the name diazepam, which is Valium, lorazepam, which is Ativan, clonazepam, which is clonavin, clonopin, and Xanax, which is Alprozal, how do you say it? Aliprozam. Aliprozam, yeah. Um, so those are the main ones. There's also a bunch under some other names that might be prescribed in the UK or other countries. Uh, if you want to know if you're on a benzodiazepine, look it up online and, you know, there'll be a list there if you just type in benzodiazepine. So they're usually prescribed for muscle spasms, tremors, along with the things that I already mentioned, um, acute seizures and alcohol and drug withdrawal. You, a lot of times they're used in detox when coming off of alcohol and drugs, usually street drugs or opioids or alcohol. Um, they are mainly used for the treatment of anxiety and panic disorder and insomnia, which is interesting. Like I, I have a lot of clients that come to me uh, that have just been taking a benzodiazepine before bed for the last 15 years, you know, it's like, and they never, they didn't, know, they didn't know what they were getting into. Yeah. yeah. So, um, benzodiazepine is also prescribed for, and this is really interesting. It's prescribed for side effects for, um, psychiatric drugs, side effects for, I mean, it's prescribed. Yes. For side effects for psychiatric drugs and withdrawal from psychiatric drugs. So a lot of times you'll start taking a, you know, Effexor or Prozac and it gives you this very, it, it starts to make you feel like you have akathisia. So it's benzodiazepine is prescribed to kind of mitigate that feeling. So it doesn't actually make the akathisia go away. It just masks it. So that's very, very common. Um, it's also prescribed for, it's used as an anesthesia for twilight sedation during any surgery. So, I mean, a lot of people, if they've had like just a minor surgery, dental surgery, they've probably been, they probably took a benzodiazepine. Um, a big one it's also prescribed for is post-traumatic stress, which means a single event of stress, which could be a very serious illness or um, an accident or, like for the veterans, you know, they go, go away to Iraq and they come back with post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, rape, 
some kind of assault, you know, a lot of like a single event would would fall under the category of post traumatic stress disorder. Um, it's also prescribed for complex PTSD, which is complex post traumatic stress, and that would be from a lifetime of traumatic events such as child abuse or domestic violence in the home. Um, it's also prescribed commonly for illness and death and or death of a loved one. So a lot of times people are prescribed a benzodiazepine if their husband, child, you know, somebody that they love, wife, brother, are going through uh, cancer treatment or other types of serious treatment that, you know, causes a lot of stress in, in you know, the loved ones. Um, there's a million other off-label uses. I mean, I've seen benzodiazepine, you know, people now carry them around in their purse. Uh, they use them just in case, you know, they get stressed out at the family dinner or, you know, over Christmas time, you know, with their family or even taking a plane ride. So benzodiazepine is used pretty commonly for a lot of things. So it's not just these very severe, um, you know, mental crises. It's used for day to day, just getting by. Um, I think that's a really good point, Rose, in that it's really been embedded and adopted into our culture as um, kind of something that we almost kind of joke about um, in the collective, you know, conscious that, um, you know, I need a Xanax. I know the Kardashians um, have talked about it on their show. It's, it's really commonly pushed and it's very socially accepted to take it for none of the things that you've mentioned, but just because you're simply stressed out. Um, so I think that's a really important point to make is that it's really moved over from all of those, you know, very serious things you were talking about to something that when you just, you know, can't handle something or something's you know, a little bit stressful or you have a family dinner to go to and you don't want to be around these people, just pop a Xanax and you're fine. Um, and I think that's, you know, really a great job. I applaud, you know, pharmaceutical companies for doing that because they've really embedded it in where it's mainstream um, and people, it's, it's, I say it's passed out like candy. Um, what it is, I've had, I've had two clients that have taken it, been prescribed um, for dental work. And then I know several have taken it just for light plastic surgery, like, like a, a face peel, or I think one was having like, you know, um, derma stamping or derma rolling done to their face. And they, you know, were given a, a Xanax for that. So it's, um, it's really gone down in terms of, I, I know when it was first invented, it was really like this wonder drug because it was replacing like um, opiates and barbiturates, which are extremely dangerous. So I think that, um, you know, the, the psychiatry was really excited to find something new, but I wanna make the point that as I researched it, initially benzodiazepines were intended for acute uh, symptoms. So like you said, if there was an acute something happened, like there was a death in the family or a serious accident, someone was very traumatized by something, that was the intention of benzodiazepines. They were only intended, and they really are only intended to be used for 30 days, because after that, that is when that dependence kicked in. Although I've seen some things that say within a few days of taking them, you're already dependent on them. Um, but my, you know, my point I want to make is that it's really been adopted. It's not being used for what it was intended to do. Um, dependence develops very, very quickly, and it's really been adopted into our culture as not that big of a deal. Oh, you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I was on them, and it was like I, I was kind of proud of my. Oh, just take a Benzo, you know. Just I didn't call, even call it. Just take a Valium. Just take an Ativan, you know. No problem. I can get through that little spurt of stuff. And um, I see people post about it on Instagram and Facebook. Like, no problem. I'm, oh, I got the stressful thing coming up. Break out the bennies or, you know, they have nicknames. They have, they're totally part of popular culture. Like it is completely accepted. It's like just part of life. It's really interesting, isn't it? The pharmaceutical industry did do a good job there. They really yeah. did. Um, so uh, one of the things I wanted to bring up is dose ranges of benzodiazepine. This is interesting because I personally 
have been on, so the first time I was prescribed benzodiazepine, I was on the max dose and was cold turkey. The second time I was prescribed benzodiazepine, I was only prescribed the minimum dose as needed. So that I thought, you know, I could just quit this drug. I'm on the minimum dose as needed, right? But, you know, I didn't, I had no idea. So the dose ranges, uh, they're usually called low dose or high dose or minimum dose or maximum dose. Um, the side effects and severity of withdrawal are not dose dependent. So that means that it doesn't matter how little or how much you're taking, you can have the exact same side effects and withdrawal symptoms. So I wanted to bring up like, as long as, so there's no such thing as a low dose. Um, as long as you're regularly taking the drug, which is as needed 10 to 20 times a month, uh, you are developing a dependence on the drug. And even at the smallest dose, you can have the same withdrawal effects as somebody taking the max dose every day. Like, so that's like kind of, I think a lot of people don't know that. And that's, that's exactly what happened to me, Rose. When I went into the emergency room, um, I showed up, I was taking the absolute minimum amount and I had done research before I went in. And when I went into the ER, the nurse intake, um, the psych you know, nurse intaker said to me, you know, how much are you taking? And I said, this is what I'm taking. I think I'm in benzo withdrawal. And she literally, I always tell the story, she literally laughed at me and she said, no way, that's too low of a dose. You're not in withdrawal. We'll, you know, we'll wait and see what the doctor says tomorrow when I saw the doctor, when I you know, went into the psych ward. Um, but the other thing that I, that I wanted to point out too is that what these are actually doing is they are affecting our GABA receptors. And, and GABA is um, you know, a neurotransmitter that makes you feel calm. And so that was the beauty, uh, but also the beast of you know, benzos is that they go in and they immediately are you know, giving you like a GABA rush. Um, they're, they're affecting that neurotransmitter and the releasing a flood of GABA very, very quickly. We, we know how fast you can feel that. You put it under your tongue, you can feel it almost immediately, um, and you drop in into this altered state. But then what it's doing very, very quickly is it's affecting those receptors where they're not able to produce on a regular basis. So your receptors are now dependent on the drug coming into your system. You're no longer able to produce that GABA yourself. Right. It's kind of like a muscle. So like you have to sort of, you know, work your muscle to like get it, to get it firm. You have to work those receptors on your own without any drug. You can't have somebody like moving your arm like this, right? You have to do it yourself. Like, um, you, so you, you have those, those receptors are like little muscles. And once you have this drug to do the job for you, it just stops doing what it's supposed to do. And then there's, there's another effect that happens after that. The drugs, the benzodiazepines themselves actually burn out your receptor. So it actually fries out your central nervous system. So not only is that muscle kind of like atrophied, you kind of like fry, the drugs themselves fry out the system. Does that make sense? So well, I'll, I'll talk about that next in to, something called tolerance. So this, it might explain it a little better when I, um, so the Jordan Peterson uh, video um, his daughter did, she talks about tolerance or interdose withdrawal or the paradoxical effect. And what happens during tolerance is um, it, it occurs when your GABA, your benzo receptors, have downregulated in response to regular use of benzodiazepines. To put simply, your benzos will no longer deliver the therapeutic effects as they did before you became tolerant. Only by increasing your dose might the effects of tolerance be counteracted. However, you are, high, you are likely, because you're already in, your, your receptors are already sort of atrophied, you're going to quickly be able, you're going to be intolerant to that next higher dose. So it's a, you're kind of racing, like you're like, oh, let me add more, let me add more, but you can't add, I mean, you'll, you know, you just can't just keep adding it. So, um, so you're likely to become tolerant of the new dose, which begins a vicious circle of escalating benzo use. Since this is completely counter to, um, 
Uh, okay, so it's, uh, sorry, I'm reading something. The only sensible solution is to taper off at a sensible relate, uh, rate and allow enough time for your GABA system to recover and regulate itself properly. Um, the longer you take a benzo, the greater chance you will develop tolerance. Most people develop tolerance and it is a gradual process. For some, this may occur and develop very rapidly within a few weeks of their first dose. And for some, it takes a lot longer. So it's better to sort of taper off your benzos very slowly before developing this you know, issue. Because what happens is you get kind of this inner dose um, issue going on. So you take the benzo, it's not enough, and you're already experiencing these withdrawal effects and this like these side effects of the benzos that you just can't make go away. They're, they're, it's like almost like, I, I could say it's kind of like a heroin addict, you know how they kind of need the drug to, to not feel the withdrawal. It's, it's the same thing as that, except it's like on a, it ha starts happening in between doses. Well, I could also really quickly, Rose, point out too, this is like the study of pharmacogenetics in terms of how people metabolize um, these medications. I'm a big believer in educating people about that uh, because I myself have a P450 chromosome uh, deficiency where I do not, my pathways, my detox pathways for mainly all psychiatric medications do not work. But it's really interesting because with a Xanax or a benzodiazepine, I actually am a rapid metabolizer, which means they go through my system, burn through my system much more quickly. So where it may say, you know, take every eight hours, I was hitting my um, withdrawal at like four hours uh, wow. and, you know, in excruciating pain when I was still on them. This is before I even quit taking them. And so thinking it was my mental illness and not drug withdrawal, I was like just, you know, burning to get to my next dose and waiting until that eight hours had expired. But actually, because of how I metabolize the drugs, I'm a rapid metabolizer, they were burning through my system even faster. So my point on that, too, is, um, you know, dosing requirements really are very gray when we just start talking about how people actually metabolize these drugs and everybody's genetics, you know, is different for, for how they use them. Oh, absolutely. So I the same. I had the same thing. So, and I will go into a little bit about that feeling between doses. So I think that's really important to talk about because um, I, I think a lot of people have that. Like they're currently walking around with that, thinking they have some other illness. Like I have an autoimmune thing. I have this. I have that. And they're going to the doctors. And I was go going to my next thing was going to mention the withdrawal symptoms and side effects can mask other can act like other illnesses. So here's where the problem really begins when you start going to the doctor going, I have nerve pain, you know, and the doctor's like, oh, you have neuropathy here, let's add gabapentin, here, let's add another drug. But honestly, like my, the nerve pain that I had was being caused by the benzo use that, I mean, that very low dose of benzos that I was on. And um, I mean, it, I was just an excruciating pain, like you were mentioning that burning, like I was on fire from the inside out. And I mean, that's one of the, I think that's one of the things that a lot of people mention is feeling like they're burning from the inside out. It feels like your skin is on fire. Yeah. Um, it literally felt like my skin was on fire all the time. Um, and just a restlessness that I still don't think we have words in the English language and our lexicon to properly explain um, the way that your body, your psyche, everything part of you is just like this. To me, it was um, like I was being taser with like a, a, a you know cattle prod yeah. um, around every you know two to three minutes. Uh, my skin was burning. I there was like a roaring in my ear, you know, my ears that I could feel, and it felt like I was being pushed forward by you know, not, you know, physically pushed, but I felt propelled forward in my body. Um, it's, it's like, a, and that's akathisia um, that a lot of people suffer from um, and, and not knowing that that's what they're suffering from. Uh, and I know that that is probably what made me more suicidal than anything on that, uh, you know, on the drugs and in the withdrawal was that it was just this um, overwhelming sense of there's no control and your brain won't stop. My, my brain simply would not stop um, the burning of the skin. And it just wasn't the brain. Like you said, it was all parts of my body. 
um, pains, um, you know, burning my skin. I felt insane. Um, the 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 ro thundering, the roaring in my ears. It it just all collectively can drive you absolutely insane. Yeah, because benzodiazepines affect the central nervous system. So I like to look at it like this: when you when I and I tell my clients this, when you take a benzodiazepine. You are essentially, let's uh, imagine your, your central nervous system as this beautiful forest, right? Like this beautiful forest, it's got this great canopy. So when it rains, you know, the, it, the ground is being protected. You know, whatever comes in, the, the trees are protecting like the animals underneath it, everything. This, the trees are like a home, like they're creating a nice warm space for everything that lives beneath it, right? Even the earth itself, right? So every time, and I t every single time I took a benzodiazepine, it was like a guy with a fire gun, you know, one of those fire guns, those like just started spraying fire at my beautiful forest, right? And so every single time it was like he sprayed fire again and like the leaves, you know, would die the first time and then they would like fall off the tree and then the, the, the branches started to, um, burn and then all of a sudden before you know after a few years of doing this i was down my central nervous system basically felt like it was just stubs like little stubs and yeah. you know sticks and stuff and burned you know just on fire everywhere and everything that was coming in was just hitting my like being at like i was completely raw there was no like canopy nothing to protect it and so, I mean, the process of rebuilding that takes a lot of time, but that's the way it felt. So I was sensitive to everything, smells, sounds, sights, light, um, like just, it was just like, it was like I was in a torture chamber in my body. It was so incredibly uncomfortable. And wow. that's from being on a low dose of benzodiazepine for, you know, as long as I want. I'd also like to point out too, Rose, that I think I've seen this kind of starting to pop up now and people's, you know, understanding and awareness of this, that what we're actually doing is we're actually, for a lot of people that have trauma already, we're actually creating another brain injury. Um, we oh, yeah. are actually, it is a brain injury and that's taken me a long time to really accept that, um, but that is what it is. Um, it is absolutely 1000% um, injuring people, um, you know, when they're on the drugs, but then also coming off the drugs, it's, you know, it creates a cascade of events in your body um, that are traumatic to it. And, and it does, it can take not to sound uh, depressing because you and I are proof that people can overcome it, um, but it, it is not a quick fix. For instance, you know, when Jordan Peterson, you know, whatever kind of treatment he's getting over in Russia, whatever he's getting, um, you know, I would absolutely have to say that he's got still a very long road of healing, um, you know, when he gets back to the States. Uh, this is not something that you, you know, snap out of or get over or really even something you can medically do. It takes time. Um, like you said, that myelin sheath, um, you know, that coats your nerves is, is gone. Um, and, and you have to, it takes a long time. Um, of proper diet and, um, you know, just rest and recovery um, to re-regulate your, your central nervous system. It's an injury though that is sustained. Oh, it is a major injury. So um, that, that myelin sheath or like my forest of like my nerves, yeah. like completely fried out, all had to like grow back. And that took so much time. And we're not talking like, oh, you'll be okay in six weeks. No. We're talking like, and I, I don't want to sound like, you know, know. <laughs> right. We're talking yeah. like a couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Um, the, the drug itself, I think um, it affected every single system of my biology, my mental framework, my psychology, my emotional state, my spiritual state. It, there was nothing left untouched, just like the guy with the fire gun. It's like, it just didn't miss anything, nothing. The only thing that was left was my core. And I, I had to rebuild everything back up after, after I came off of that drug. And they, that may sound extreme, but that's really what it felt like. Well, and I like to speak too, absolutely, you know, that 
what you did and what I did where we were doing this, but we did not have the, the benefit of any medical doctors, uh, you know, certainly Kelly Brogan um, is who, you know, we both made it to eventually. But initially when we were first doing the work, we were doing it on our own. Yeah. Um, and, and like I said, you know, I was, you know, showed up at the ER telling them I was in benzo withdrawal. They laughed at me, you know, the next day, the doctor, you know, diagnosed me as bipolar. And on top of that injury I already had from the withdrawal and from the drug, they added, you know, five other drugs um, yeah. into my system all at once, dumped them all into my body at one time. And it would be another, I think, you know, eight months before I would cold turkey which withdrawal, which I don't recommend anyone do that. I did not know any better at the time, um, but those five drugs I had to come off of the next April or May. Um, so you and I made our way out of this without the benefit of any doctors validating, you know, what we were going through. And I know there's a lot of people, a lot of people that are doing the same thing now, not really, like you said earlier, not understanding what's actually going on um, and, and that they you know, have developed a dependence on these drugs and they go to their doctor, their doctors are not educated. And so it very quickly becomes a really deadly situation for people. Right. So, um, absolutely. So, and the next question was, what is the support for benzo withdrawal? What is the support for, it's like, I did not have any, none, zero zip, nothing. It was either you're, you're, you can be off this drug in six weeks or, if if you said I want to go off this drug, it brought up a lot. It was very threatening to the doctor because the doctor, if you say I think I'm I might be dependent on this drug, and I mean I think this is it might be part ego, it might be part um, self preservation or safety reasons. The doctor will sometimes just take you off the drug without. And then be like, well, you're addicted. We got to take you off because I think so, it rings some sort of alarm bell in the medical profession, professional, because um, they don't really want to be a part. They, as, as soon as it's almost like they're faced with a reality or a truth that they don't want to be a part of. So they're like, I, they don't want to take responsibility for your dependence on this drug. I, I've had clients that have absolutely been in a rush to find a doctor to keep the prescription going yep. because their originating doctor stopped it. He won't prescribe anymore. Well, now we've got them in a possible acute withdrawal. So now they're trying to find another doctor, you know, to help them out, to give them a prescription for it. So they don't go into, you know, acute withdrawal. So it's, um, it's just a lot of ignorance. Um, a lot of miseducation. I'm going to go out on a limb. And one of my theories is, I've got to say it, I think that there are a lot of people practicing psychiatry that are actually on these medications. Um, and they're very embarrassed about it. or they, they think there's a big stigma behind it. So they do not really, they're kind of projecting their own um, worries or fears about the drugs yeah. um, to their patients. Uh, and, you know, I, I think that's, um, it's just a lot of mis misinformation going around, very much so. Yeah, a lot. And I honestly, just for this uh, web class we're doing, I did a little bit of a search and I was just shocked at the very prestigious Harvard and, you know, these other prestigious uh, medical schools, teaching, you know, whatever, medical industries, uh, the misinformation that they had, like, I was just like, this is just so, so wrong. And so when you do, as a regular person, go online to look, the first thing you get is this, like, you know, this, basically this watered down version of the story. And you have to dig really deep or know somebody or somebody say, hey, you know, go over here, look on this web page or whatever. Otherwise, seriously, right? Like it's, it's like, it's like a lot of people are getting off of benzodiazepines and other psychiatric meds in the back rooms of Facebook. I mean, it thousand oh, percent. That's where it's really gone. I mean, it, to me, it's kind of like, an, you know, the old abortion story when they were outlawed, uh, people were going underground to figure out how to manage this. This is not being taken care of in the collective mainstream um, of psychiatry. It's just not. And, and they are starting to catch on, but I honestly think it's only because there are people with lived experience like you and I 
that are speaking out and saying, you know what, I, I'm not mentally ill. Um, I never was. Uh, and I survived these drugs. And this is what it felt like. And then we say, what are you saying about this? What do you have to say? And we're actually calling them on the carpet. Other than that, I don't think they'd still be addressing it. I think there are too many people that are surviving that are making the connection that this is what's causing it. It wasn't um, you know, neuropathy, it wasn't this, it was actually the benzos that were causing it. We're able to make that connection now and we're calling uh, you know, pharmaceutical companies on the carpet to address it. Absolutely, and that's why this, um, you know, this whole thing with Jordan Peterson is kind of big for the benzo community and the communities of people you know, they feel validated. It's like, oh my God, I'm not crazy. Here's like a, you know, a person, you know, who has, you know, a million followers, you know, going out and saying like, I had to go to Russia to get treatment for this. And I mean, that's just absurd. Like really, like why couldn't he get treatment here? Why? You know, and it's, this, it's the same reason why none of us could. Um, and one of the things I want to bring up is like the lack of credibility that I had. As, so because I was prescribed drugs and because I was diagnosed with depression, my credibility went down to like nothing. Doctors were just like, what do you know? You're, you know, a psych patient. Your credibility and, with, with your body. Right. So if I was saying like, I'm experiencing this, yeah. they basically were like, no, you're not. Yeah. And that was like, so that was like when I completely turned I was very dependent on the medical um you know the me the whole medical framework you know for for a lot of things and it kind of like really like left a really sour taste in my mouth and uh, a lot of mistrust toward doctors it's it's medical gaslighting is I yeah. mean that's what it is and it um, really takes the patient who's already suffering anyway you know they're already on the drugs they're already in a state their their perception is already altered um, the drugs are already creating an injury, and now they're reaching out to a lot of times the um, you know originating uh, prescriber, the physician that initially prescribed to them to ask what's going on, and they're gaslit. I'm not saying the doctors are doing that intentionally. Again, that's misinformation and usually ignorance on their part and a fear, um, you know, of not knowing the answer or you know looking stupid on the doctor's part. But nonetheless, the effects to the patients are still the same in that they're being gaslit. Um, their symptoms aren't recognized. They're not making the connection that it's the benzos. And so it really has. That's where you find the healing going on is, you know, programs like Kelly Brogan's um, that, you know, we were in and that we coach for now, but also tons of chat rooms. Um, I don't know how many Facebook support groups, um, you know, I've been involved in or, you know, helped out in and, and not to be negative, but it's dire. I mean, it's like a war zone. Um, in these in these groups of people not understanding, um, you know, what's really going on with their bodies, their bodies are out of control, and they can't seem to get any type of relief, nor can they get any type of um, support from the from the you know, medical community for the most part. It's right. And they and they don't have the resources a lot of times. Yes. for you know, like big medical intervention or to take time it. off work. Right. I mean, another thing to take time off work or to you know, travel to Russia or to travel to any clinic, take time off of work to do that. Um, it's, it's, um, it, to me, it's a modern, I know what it is to you too, it's, a, it's like a modern day Holocaust mm -hmm. um, happening amongst us. I know that we may sound, you know, I may sound very dramatic, but when you've worked um, with the people that you know, we've worked with or you've experienced it like we have, or you've been in those benzo um, chat rooms and seen the number, uh, I mean, thousands of people suffering and then you know every couple of days it's so and so kill themselves so and so kill themselves um it's it's um it's a holocaust happening right in front of us it's just not being acknowledged yet no it isn't and it's the one of the biggest things that i found so when i do get clients that you know are in the midst of benzo withdrawal or tapers i mean they are in such a state and everywhere they've gone they've kind of been sort of uh, marginalized or yes. not believed or not validated. So one of the biggest things is for me just to say, I believe you is such a huge relief to their central nerve. It's like, oh my God, you know, and it's like that lack of compassion in the medical field is 
like really dangerous and toxic. And that's where it like just breaks my heart. It's like, how did we, how did we get here? How did we become, how did we get to this place where there's no compassion for this, what this person's saying? I mean, why don't we believe them? Well, I called you when the, when the Jordan Peterson story broke, I called you and I was triggered and I'm, you know, very well into my healing. I'm really emotionally sound, but I was like, I'm very triggered because you and I, you know, here we have a man that's a, you know, very, you know, I, I know he's controversial, but in the collective of, um, you know, the world, he is, you know, respected and he's very trending. He's got the book, 12, you know, 12 rules for life. Um, he's an academic, he's a professor. Um, you know, he, he is in psychology. So he's, he's in our, you know, the area of mental health, he's really respected. And here we have him having to, you know, break down. His daughter said he was near death. He was suicidal. And he has to go to a clinic in Russia while, you know, Rose and I, I'm in Kansas City laid out, you know, with a hospital and a psych ward. And, you know, Rose, you're, you know, near death. And we have millions of other people that are doing this on the dirty, you know, on the low by themselves. And it was just like, you know, I, I'm, I'm very, certainly I don't want him to suffer by any means. And it's wonderful. I couldn't have picked a better person, you know, to, if this is going to happen to someone that hopefully he can use this experience to really speak to the suffering that is happening. But I had to say, you know, I called you Rose because it was so triggering to me to know my story and how I got zero validation. Yeah. Zero. In fact, I was, you know, you and I were re-traumatized um, by the medical community after we had been injured, you know, by benzos. Yes, it was incredibly painful. Mm -hmm. Like that betrayal, that, that's what it felt like. It felt like a deep, deep betrayal. Mm -hmm. And I trusted my doctor. I really trusted him. And I mean, it was just like, no, you're not going through that. That can't be that. And yeah. you, you have this, this, and this, and this. And I'm like, I know, I know that's, I don't have this, this, and this, and this. Mm -hmm. And it made me actually kind of afraid of doctors. I'm going to be honest with you because I'm, I, it was, I was just so deeply betrayed and hurt. I mean, it took me a long time to grieve that, to grieve that, you know, that, that betrayal for real. No, I totally agree. Yeah. Also, like what you're saying, the whole, the whole thing caused this like post-traumatic stress syndrome and not only the, the trauma of the events, like the cutting off of the drug, it was like losing my arms, you know, and it was like, okay, we're going to cut your arms off and then we're going to sew them back on. Then you got to learn how to reuse them, you know? And, and we're also we're gonna, gonna tell you what's wrong with you. You should be able to do all of this with no problem. <laughs> right, exactly, right. Nothing's really happened to you, so. <laughs> right, nothing happened to you. Yeah. What's wrong, why can't you move your arms, you know? Yeah. And um, it was like, I mean, that trauma like was so incredibly profound. It like, it changed me. It really did. It really, really changed me. I was already, you know, pretty fragile because I had been, you know, I was diagnosed with depression, but I wasn't like, um, I mean, it's depression. Like there's a million people in the world, over mil millions of people in the world with depression. Mm -hmm. that, that, that whole thing, that medication, that withdrawal, the, the getting off the medication was just profoundly, profoundly traumatic for me. And I've had to recover from that, like just that, <laughs> that syndrome, that post-traumatic syndrome. Yes. Um, so one of, uh, so we talked about this a little bit, like, uh, some of the things I hear what my, what my clients say, I'm like, you know, what do your physicians tell you about benzodiazepines? I, these are some of the lines I've heard. There's no need to quit this. You can take this for the rest of your life. You know, when they do broach the subject and I'm always like, I think your doctor's on that drug, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. <laughs> Uh, it's a low dose. Just keep it in your back pocket just in case. You know, that's another one. You're doing great. Don't rock the apple cart, you know? Um, or here's the, uh, if you, oh, you want to stop, we can get you off in six weeks, um, you know, or let's just take you off right now. I'll yeah. cut the dose. And they're just like, oh, wait, no, I changed my mind. You know what I mean? Because they know, we know from when we were on the drug, that if we ran out toward the end of the month, 
we were miserable for like that until we could get a refill. And I think a lot of people are living their life like that, like terrified of running out of their benzodiazepine. So not only are they sort of like in this physical, um, you know, dance, they're also in this mental dance. So I have to be really careful and then feeling very guilty because if they do run out or call their doctor early and say, Hey, I ran out three days early. The doctor's like, Oh no, you have to wait. You know what I mean? Like, oh, they, I mean, they treat you like, you know, I mean, certainly mine was, you know, I, I ran out. I mean, I will, I, I ran out. Um, and I will say this just in case anyone is in that situation. When I ran out, I thought, you know, I had a lot of guilt and shame around taking them. And so I took my last one and I had not bothered to get a refill. Um, but I thought, you know, this is probably for the best. I probably need to like, cause I'd have heard all that jargon of like, you know, oh, you're tougher than that. You don't need it. Um, you know, that's a crutch. And I kind of had that uh, conditioning in, in my head. And so I thought, you know, this is probably really good that I've run out of them and I'll just tough it out. And, um, <laughs> next day I don't drink at all. And I was in my kitchen pouring wine. Um, at like nine in the morning because I, my body was on fire. Um, yeah. I literally went to pour myself a, a glass of wine, just somehow self-medicating to regulate my emotions because it was so um, off the charts. So, um, but yeah, they, they, yes, to your point, the, the doctors, a lot of doctors treat people. There's a difference between addiction and dependence. And a lot of doctors will treat um, psychiatric patients, especially on psych drugs, like they're addicts. Um, they're not addicts. They're physiologically dependent on the drugs now, but they appear like addicts. And it's a big difference. And not to, I'm not, you know, trying to, uh, you know, throw shade on addiction, you know, either or addicts, but it's the, it's the way that um, a lot of psychiatry or the mental health professionals treat people that, that have mental illness that are using these psych drugs when they reach these levels of instability. I've seen it. I was treated that way where I was literally like an out of control lunatic. Um, you know, I mean, you think I was literally like, you know, freebasing crack cocaine in my basement because they looked at me with absolute, um, just kind of like disdain. Disdain. Uh, and, um, yep. you know, I've had, I had two tell me, you know, we can't do anything with you. You know, you're just too far gone. I, I know I've told this before. My last doctor had me scheduled for ECT, which is electric shock therapy. Um, that was going to be my, you know, next treatment. Um, and yet here I am. You know, here I am, here you are, uh, you know, five years later for you, you know, four years later for me, we're on zero drugs, but based on the mental health, we were dead. Yeah. You know, I had a death stamp. I was going to die in that system. And, and here we are out of the system and appear to be doing quite well. <laughs> yeah, I'd you know? say. So yeah. yeah, that's another thing I want to mention. Like it is totally 100% possible to heal from this, even regardless of, you know, the situation we went through, we were able to find support and we were able to be validated and we were able to find other compassionate people to, you know, walk this journey together. And that's been one of the biggest things for me is finding those other, the peers. So this is basically what I think the wave of the future is for you know, getting off these drugs or the support for getting off these drugs is peer to peer support. And, um, I mean, that's really the only way, like I can see it happening. Like it's just, and it's, there's something really, um, beautiful in it. It, it really is. It's like a very organic way to heal. And much um, easier when you're, when you have someone around you that we're able to hold the space for each other, because I know, I, when I look at you and you tell me what you've gone through, I know what that feels like and, and you with me. And so that's much easier. Um, you know, I'm not up here and you're not down here or vice versa. We're, you know, we're peers and we, we can hold the space for each other because, you know, we know what that feels like. Yeah, totally. And that's also, I mean, it kind of like levels the playing field in all, so it doesn't matter what race or, you know, financial status or whatever wherever you came from it's like right. we're all the same and we kind of like this we meet here and it's like there's something really quite um organically uh healing about it like you were saying it's it's just it's it's and we see each other you know and we validate each other and it's really nice the one the one of the things i wanted to mention was um 
one of the last things, I, I don't want to get too deeply into this. I'm going to link below the video. Um, what are some of the symptoms and what some of the withdrawal symptoms and side effects of benzodiazepine? So it's, if you read the benzodiazepine inserts, uh, let's say you get like five of them, the, all of them, clonopin, um, Xanax. I think they're all pretty similar with some have a little bit very, you know, very, a little bit differences. But those side effects, what they say are rare, are not rare. So uh, that I wanted to bring that up. I want to point that out because she, um, Mika, is her name Mikhail? Mikhail? Mikhail, yeah, yeah, I think. Michaela. So. She brings up, uh, she says something like, this is, it's a rare, this is rare, but it's not that uncommon. It's not rare. So between 20 and 80% of people coming off of benzodiazepine experience like a pretty severe withdrawal. They can't, we, the, the source that I um, looked up can't, can't really, the, the information is very, um, you know, not available. Yeah, it's just not available, but they, they believe it's between 20 and 80% of people that um, are on benzodiazepines experience this profound withdrawal. Um, some of them, it says a percentage of those will be like the severe where I had the protracted, so it lasts, uh, it lasted a really long time, people, but for the most part, the the withdrawal period runs, I, I'd say it's anywhere between like a year, a year and a half, like that sort of intense withdrawal. Easily. Like yeah, that. easily. And that's the, that's regular withdrawal. That's not like severe withdrawal. That's, just that's not regular. protracted. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's just, yeah. 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 And um, so the symptom is, I just want to make sure that people understand, again, it's definitely possible to heal, but I mean, it is, um, you are not getting relief a lot of times. I mean, it is a severe type of pain, um, confusion, um, altered perception that you go through uh, to come off of these drugs. Yep. Um, but, but I think, you know, Rose, you and I are, are living proof that it can be done. But it's, it, it's, we, we are so pain adverse um, in our culture now. Um, and even when we're talking about coming off these drugs, we already have people that have kind of bought into the mindset of, I don't want any pain. And I was one of those people, you know, that's why I was taking the drugs. I didn't like feeling uncomfortable or, you know, whatever. So I really bought into the system of mental illness. But so I really had to, you know, up my game in terms of my backbone. I mean, being able to, you know, my pain tolerance is pretty damn high now, um, where it was not before I was, you know, what you would call a mental midget. Um, but now, you know, you and I pretty <laughs> have a little bit of resiliency going on now. Um, but, you know, the point is, is that it's a, it's a very intense, um, you know, not to paint a negative picture. Um, you will get something definitely out of it. And that is called, you know, strength and resiliency. But it's, it's, it's difficult. It's difficult. Yes, it is. Um, one of the things that, so some of this, the site, what I wanted to mention, and this is something brought up a lot too, one of the last little pieces here, is when you are going through this withdrawal period, like especially when you first go off of the whatever drug you, that you were on, um, you'll go to your doctor and they will say, that's your original symptoms coming back. That's the rebound effect. Yeah. Okay, that's a huge one. It's like, yeah. okay, so let's get this straight. None of the symptoms that I experienced when I came off these drugs had anything to do with my original illness. Right. Like this was beyond... Right. anything that I could even ever imagine and to think like because because you're kind of in this like this sort of mental you know you're kind of um in a trance because of the drug you kind of just believe that oh my god you're right my symptoms are coming back you know I'm yeah. my, my anxiety or my panic disorder or whatever it was yeah. or now I have like some terrible like uh, it my my problem progressed into something even more like bipolar or OCD yeah. or whatever, psychosis. And that's just not true. This is actually withdrawal from the drugs. Mm -hmm. So very true. Yeah. So do you want to finish up? I, I mean, I think that's, you know, I just um, think education is the main thing. Um, and I, I think in terms of even healing from it, it's educating um, you know, certainly, um, you know, working or talking to people that have gone through it, I think is probably the most beneficial. Um, 
because we know what that feels like. And I think it's also really important to um, have people that, you know, kind of are a little bit farther ahead of you in this process um, that you can see have done it and have accomplished it. Um, but, but, you know, yeah, I would just like people to know that, that it's not what you think it is. It's what you've kind of been conditioned, um, you know, by a lot of pharmaceutical companies to think um, is going on with you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of before we before we close, I wanted to mention the this last like thing, like do not ever ever stop your benzodiazepine abruptly. Um, Allie and I are not medical professionals. We're not, you know, like you need to contact your doctor. <laughs> like this, we're not giving you any medical advice. We're just uh, sharing our own experience. Um, but when, if you do. Uh, are, if you're interested in getting off your benzodiazepine, there's a lot of resources out there, and I'm going to link to them in the in, below the video. Um, but your benzo, just to, to, to throw this out there, your benzodiazepine uh, taper should it could it could be anywhere between like eight months to a year or two years. That's how long they take. So I mean, I would I would really like research very, very, very uh, well before you decide to go off your benzodiazepine. I agree. Yeah. yeah. All right. And thanks, everybody. I appreciate you watching. Um, if you have any questions, ask in the comments. And thank you very much, Ellie. I appreciate it. It's, it's, been, a, it's been a pleasure to be on this road with you. Yes. All right. Bye. Bye-bye.